What's up, y'all? It's Dr. Paul with another mail call for Liberty Hill Comics. I have over 40 years' experience collecting comic books, and my channel is about sharing my experience and passion for comic book collecting, investing, and conservation with you. Today, we're opening a true grail, and it's one that is personal for me. I'm really happy to share it with you. I'm glad you're here with me today. I'm especially appreciative of the folks who take the time to like the video, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Because the reason I'm here is to share with you all my passion and to create some community. So the more engagement we have, the better that community is. So thank you, those of you that are contributing to that. And I think you will especially enjoy today because we have a book here that I know is important, very important to a lot of people. This is a book that has just had a positive impact on so many people's lives. This is an odd... Oh, I can see what we've done. We've used... We've taped it here in here. It's just had such an impact on so many people lives. These characters are beloved characters that so many people can relate to and that helped so many people through times in their life when they were having trouble and they were feeling maybe alone, isolated, different. And so... I know that this opening is going to resonate with a lot of the viewers of this channel. Wow. Well, this is a record. One, two, three, four, five USPS bubble mailers. That's all it took. Five bubble mailers. Holy smokes. Look at that. What a stunning book. Well, like I said, it's a true grail for me. You have to forgive my momentary speechlessness. What is it and why do we care? This, of course, is Giant Size X-Men number one in CGC 9.0 with off-white pages. It's the June 1975 issue, credited to Len Wein and Dave Cockrum. More about credits later. It's the first appearance of the new X-Men, the first appearance of Storm, the first appearance of Colossus, the first appearance of Nightcrawler, and the first appearance of Thunderbird. CGC calls it the second full appearance of Wolverine, I think that's a reasonable way to describe it. It's technically his fourth appearance, but he's limited to a single panel in Hulk 180 and Hulk 182. So second full appearance is a reasonable way. It's also the first appearance of Krakoa, which isn't on the CGC label, but given current comic book continuity in which Krakoa has become increasingly important, it probably should be on the CGC label and maybe in the future. It's a 36 page masterwork that is the foundation to the house that Claremont built and probably the single most important significant comic for many of us that grew up loving comic books because of Chris Claremont's writing on the X-Men. The concept of the new X-Men is usually credited to Roy Thomas, who had been writer on the Silver Age X-Men book after Stan Lee 
starting with issue number 20 in May of 1966. But his run on the X-Men was never a commercial success. And after issue 66, the X-Men lapsed into reprints. Effectively, it was canceled, but by continuing to publish reprints, Martin Goodman could make a little revenue from it while spending no more money on a creative team. By 1973, Roy Thomas was editor-in-chief of Marvel. Stan had been promoted to publisher, and Marvel at the time was owned by Cadence Industries, which had purchased them in 1968 and also owned the overseas distribution rights. As Roy recalls in The X-Men Companion, then-president of Cadence Industries, Al Landau, suggested to Roy in 1973 that Marvel should have a team of international superheroes because he thought it would help them sell very well in their overseas markets. Roy liked the idea. He was a huge fan of the Golden Age and the concept had been very successful on the Blackhawks. Roy thought a relaunch of the X-Men was the perfect way to accomplish it and he tapped Mike Friedrich and Dave Cockrum to put something together. But the project wasn't fully greenlit until a few years later, and by then Mike Friedrich had moved on, so the writing was reassigned to Len Wein. He worked with Dave Cockrum to assemble the new international X-Men team. Len had co-created Wolverine for the Incredible Hulk with collaborators Roy Thomas and John Romita. Most of the rest of the team came from Dave Cockrum Concepts, some of which were rejected Legion of Superhero pitches from Dave's run at DC that were polished into their final forms by Len and Dave and with occasional input from Roy Thomas as editor. They developed the plot for giant-sized X-Men number one and got a plot assist from Chris Claremont, whose idea it was for Lorna Dane to be the one who ultimately dispatched Krakoa. And it's a pretty tight plot. It tells you just about everything you need to know about the new team to get you excited and leave you wanting more. It kicks off with a great Dave Cockrum splash page, and then we're thrown into the story with Professor X recruiting the new members. First, Nightcrawler, Kurt Wagner, who is living somewhere in Bavaria and being hunted and persecuted because of his demonic appearance. Then, Wolverine, whose given name was not yet known, working as an agent of the Canadian government. Two quick panels to pick up Banshee, Sean Cassidy, a Silver Age creation of Roy Thomas and artist Werner Roth from issue number 28. Then Storm, Aurora Monroe, who is living in Africa as a weather goddess. Two quick panels to pick up Sunfire, Shiro Yoshida, who was also co-created by Roy Thomas, this time with Don Heck back in issue number 64. And then off to Siberia to recruit Colossus, Peter Rasputin, a simple Soviet farmer. And finally, Arizona to recruit Thunderbird, John Proudstar, who sadly is not long for the Marvel 616. Once back at the mansion, the new recruits are given new costumes made of unstable molecules and introduced to Cyclops, who has a newly revised visor. He recalls the tale of how the original team set out to find a mutant on the isolated island of Krakoa, but were captured and only he escaped and returned to the X-Mansion to recover, while Professor recruited the new team to help him rescue the original X-Men. The team heads out for Krakoa in their Stratojet because they won't get the Blackbird until next issue when Chris Claremont starts scripting and are dropped off in the island in pairs. Cyclops and Thunderbird are the last to arrive and when they land the Stratojet, the island swallows it up and a temple materializes. Each of the teams of two faces obstacles but all arrive at the temple safely. Upon entering the temple, they quickly see the rest of the original team held captive and connected to something that is apparently feeding upon them. As the new X-Men begin to free them, the temple starts to come down around both the teams and it is revealed that the mutant they were seeking is the island itself, a sentient being named Krakoa, created by an atomic bomb test and feeding off of fellow mutants. It released Cyclops on purpose intending for him to bring more food. Professor X dictates the strategy from afar, and the battle is joined on two fronts, 
with Professor X engaging Krakoa in a telepathic battle while the team revive and power up Lorna Dane. The invigorated Polaris severs the island's magnetic connection to the Earth, releasing it from gravity, and Krakoa hurtles off into space. Bobby Drake puts an ice bubble around all the X-Men until the Stratojet floats to the surface of the sea and they all climb aboard and head back to the mansion. Len Wein plots the next two issues, but is overworked and gives the series up to relative newcomer Chris Claremont, who scripts issues 94 and 95, and then becomes the full-time writer from issue 96 on. Chris Claremont would go on with collaborators to take the commercially failed team to the top of critical and commercial success in the comic book industry. He wrote nearly every mutant story Marvel published for 17 years, from 1975 to 1991, during which time he created or co-created all of the mutant heroes we've come to know and love, as well as some of the most popular and critically acclaimed stories, including the Dark Phoenix Saga and Days of Future Past, just to name the top two. He also fleshed out all the characters he inherited from Len Wein and Dave Cockrum into the characters we all know and love today. He wrote the best-selling comic book of all time, the relaunched X-Men number one in 1991 that sold over 8 million copies and still holds a Guinness Book record over 30 years later. And it was all made possible by the publication of this book right here. For those of us that grew up reading comic books because of his X-Men stories, this book is hallowed ground. And I don't think it can be overstated how much this book shaped the history of the comic book industry then and today, and how many lives it affected. If you've ever felt strange, weird, or like you don't belong, and you read an X-Men book and felt just a little bit better about yourself, this book impacted your life. Fortunately for us collectors, this is not a rare book. There are 11,408 universal copies of Giant Size X-Men number one in the CGC census with a median grade of 7.5. And this 9.0 copy is just inside the top quartile in the census. A CGC 9.0 has a fair market value today of $6,250 plus shipping and taxes with a 12-month trailing average of $6,175 and an all-time high of $12,650 set during the pandemic. So this book is discounted right now by over 50% to its record high prices when it was selling for well over $1,000 per point. I paid $4,850 plus shipping and taxes for this 9.0 after being the high bidder on an eBay auction. This is over a 60% discount to the all-time high on this he book. I've owned a mid-grade raw copy for a few years and I was thrilled to be able to step up to a higher grade copy at such an attractive entry point on this blue chip book. When you consider that the X-Men will eventually make their way into the MCU, I wanna have a copy of this book in my personal collection before that happens. I hope you enjoyed this video on this blue chip Marvel Bronze Age key. This one, as you can tell, is personal for me because without it, I probably wouldn't have been an avid comic book reader as a young man. And without that love of reading, I probably wouldn't have excelled academically and probably wouldn't have been able to pursue a career in science and medicine. This hobby really has given me so much and I'm happy to share my passion here on the channel for these funny books. Anyone else out there a fan of Claremont's X-Men? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And until next time, happy hunting and take care of one another.